coming up on Miked Up. I don't need you to believe in hypnosis to understand what I do, because one, belief is no longer part of the equation. Welcome to Miked Up. I'm your host, Mike DiCiocio. I'm bringing you inspiring stories and insights from entrepreneurs, award-winning authors, thought leaders, business and mindset coaches, peak performers, entertainers, and other talented individuals who are excited to provide you with the ammo needed to level up and achieve your greatest dreams. All episodes are available on audio and video at mikeduppodcast.com, M-I-K-E-D up podcast.com. Thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the show. Our guest today is a certified professional hypnotist who has dedicated nearly two decades of his career to discovering exactly how hypnosis can quickly, effectively, and permanently rewrite negative limiting beliefs and thought patterns to help emerging business leaders succeed, even when they're, they've been stuck for years. He's the best selling author of Work Smart Business Lessons Learned from Hypnotizing 250,000 People and Building a Million Dollar Brand a five-star rated book available on Amazon. Welcome to the show, the number one rated hypnotic consulting expert in the game and the host of the Hypnotic Language Hacks podcast, Jason Lynette. Mike, you covered everything. Thanks for having me. I covered it all and my, 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 tongue is tw- my tongue is twisted. It's tapped out. It's like, bro, what are we you doing? You pronounce hypnosis we- properly every time. So already we're off to a great start. Yeah. And my eyes are crossed. <laughs> Dude, super impressive bio. Thank you for being with us today. I know this is three times a charm. Both of us have had some health things going on. So we're both healthy. We're both doing well. You're looking good. I know you made a big move. So you got some energy behind being in a new spot. So cheers to move your move to Orlando. And I just, I want to dive right in and let people know they can connect with you on social media. You're kicking butt on social media. It's all clickable and your website's there as well. More people are going to want to tune in and learn about your podcast and all that good stuff. So in the show notes, clickable. Are you ready to rock and roll? Let's bring it. Yeah, let's do this. So little setup. I want to tell, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kind of try to keep it a little short story. I do not know a lot about hypnosis. So I did a little bit of research, but you're going to be educating me as kind of your first audience member today and everybody who's with us on YouTube and tuning in on Apple and Spotify and and iHeartRadio and all those great places that they're on. But the reason I wanted to bring you on is because what I learned about you is that you practice good ethics. And I wouldn't have you here if you didn't. So this is not a manipulation. I know there might be some people go like, I don't know about hypnosis, like to change my think. They may be pushing back on the concept. I actually did a little bit at first. When I was reading your bio to get you on the show, I'm like, wait a minute, what are we talking about? So you you flipped that whole thing. You helped flip the negative limiting beliefs, turn them into fuel for good. So we're going to unpack that in a minute. And so I just want to say, first of all, thank you for being here. And I want you to talk to that, speak to that person who may be a little bit pushed back on the whole hypnosis thing because they're afraid that it's some kind of weird foreign thing that they're not familiar with. Yeah, and there's actually two good answers to that. One would be that, For the earlier part of my career, the main focus was that of helping people with personal change. So that's overcoming a fear, shifting a set of habits and behaviors, increasing confidence, taking down whatever negative emotions were holding them back. And the story that I always go to, rather than go to all the science and the research, which we can get into, is this man who was in front of me. This had to have been 2014 or 2015, so quite some time ago. And he's in front of me because he wants to quit smoking. And like we're doing the standard, as you might expect, intake. I'm explaining this is what hypnosis is. This is what hypnosis is not. You're not going to be asleep. I'm not going to make you do things you normally wouldn't do. And it's a positive conversation. And he's ready to make this change. And suddenly, Mike, the the tone in the room shifts because he points his finger at me. And he goes, yeah, but you're just going to persuade me today. And in my left hand, I had my clipboard with all the notes I had been taking. In my right hand, I had like the new client forms he had filled out with a whole history as to how he started and why he wants to stop. And I heard him say, you're just going to persuade me today. And the only thing that made sense to do in that moment was to hold up my notes and the stuff he had written and go, yeah, I'm going to help you get what you want. You've already decided what you want to achieve. Just up until now, you haven't yet been able to do it on your own. 
So if you want to phrase it that way, yes, I'm going to persuade you today to stop smoking because one, you've asked me to, and two, I'm going to use your words because let's call it inherently lazy, but the difference is this time it's actually going to stick. It's more powerful of its own words. Yeah, that's amazing. And he, and, he, and he paused and he goes, that makes more sense than anything I've ever done before. Thank you. Which yeah. that really is the core of it, that we're helping someone to amplify what they want. It's where in the last couple of years, the focus has now shifted. And it's what happened when I was kind of running a business about the same time as that other story, where on the surface, things looked successful, but it was about the same complacency as most others, that it was difficult to raise the rates. It was difficult to scale things up because the problem was I was running a business that looked like everyone else's, which then was performing about as well as everyone else's. And it's what happened instead by lifting up the hypnotherapeutic language patterns that have all this research, all this data in terms of what they can and can do, and started to put them ethically into the sales journey. And it's where that's where I spend most of my time now. So it's for most of your audience, you'll love this way of phrasing it, that I don't need you to believe in hypnosis to understand what I do. Because one, belief is no longer part of the equation. There's research as early as the 1970s and well beyond as neuroscience has advanced that prove how it's happening in the brain, what makes it effective, and what it helps for. And it's instead, I don't need you to hypnotize your clients to buy from you. Instead, it's understanding what happens when we put the right words in the right order at the right time to create this pre-sold relationship where our ideal clients are now wanting more from us even before we ask for the sale. It's like a mental unlock. Those are the two words that kind of come to my mind right now. The famous phrase in the hypnosis world is that, you know, if it's a personal change, it's not that I need to hypnotize you to get over that fear. It's more that I'm going to help you to dehypnotize yourself. The definition of hypnosis classically would be it's the bypassing of that critical element of the mind, which that's kind of what people are already doing when they're in a problematic mental structure. I know this is the guy from before. I know that cigarette is killing me. Yet at the same time, I'm saying it relaxes me. I know that food isn't going to get rid of this emotion, yet I'm eating in response to it. I know these are many of my entrepreneurs I work with for public speaking issues or issues around imposter syndrome and putting yourself out there. I know my message is going to impact people's lives, but I'm nervous when I turn on the webcam. So it's the playful phrase of, well, congratulations, you're kind of already doing hypnosis. Let me show you how to do it better. And that confidence really goes up as now they put the intention and the understanding in their communication. And it's not just this blanket, what I call content confetti cannon, putting yourself out there for the sake of putting yourself out there. It's instead knowing what the communication is doing to activate the right triggers in the right audience's mind. So like a magnet, this is the ethical part, as it aligns with what people want, that's who responds. If it doesn't align, they have a way to respectfully move on to something else. So it's that boosting of confidence, not just from the emotions, but also from the tactical language side, right words at the right time to affect that change. One of the biggest, and I learned this from a really young age, I, for someone to ever fix something, you have to realize it first. I learned this when I was 15 years old, my first girlfriend ever. When we get in there a little bickering our arguments, it was always because the other person didn't realize they were doing something. She would say something or it just bugged me so bad. We'd be on her phone calls, you know, and it's like, I could, it was hard to explain until someone realizes it. So if someone comes to you and you're coaching them or you're helping them stop smoke or with an addiction or better their business or improve their personal performance, all of the above or any of the above kind of thing. Until they realize that they don't know they need help with it. So you're helping them. They have all the puzzle pieces kind of laying around like a jigsaw in the brain. And you're helping them put them back together. Is that, am I understanding that right in a sense? Let me put this in a slightly different perspective. And we're going to take a well-known business term that I won't try to claim as my own. A lot of people have used the phrase of buyer's pocket. And in a sales process, when it's done effectively, you're achieving what's called a buyer's pocket relationship, which is that there is a massive level of clarity where suddenly I now know why all the other stuff I've attempted hasn't yet worked. 
I understand what this new thing is and why that's going to work better. And there's a feeling of clarity. There's a sense of relief because now I feel like I've achieved a win because at least now I know what needs to happen. The buyer's pocket, though, is that it also reveals I can't yet do it on my own. And that's why I need to get that course, hire the expert, work with someone one-to-one, join a mastermind, fill in the blank, whatever the product may be. It's too often people look at that situation externally and they don't bring it back upon themselves. And it's where I would always say, not for the sake that these would have been the people who, when the career path was only working with one-to-one clients, they were the source of my income and fed my family. And not even for this nature of, as I run a private consulting group where we help people to empower that language better, it comes around to the reality that the recognition that I need to do this and I need help to do it, no matter what someone else's opinion would be, that's a position of strength. I mean, can I, can I tell a slightly inappropriate story here? <laughs> yeah. If, okay. if you think you can and help our I'll, audience, I'll, which it sounds like you, well, you can, then yes. I'll, I'll very clearly leave out the who of the story, uh, sure. which is I'll just say family member. And we'll leave it at that. But it's a bunch of years ago. It's like a Thanksgiving gathering. And the uh, breaking of ice was there's really enough crazy people out there to keep you in business, which let yourself build every possible stereotype of someone who does a ton of external blame, puts all the fault on everything outside of the world because, of course, they're flawless. And uh, multiply that by 10. Yeah, that's this family member. And (laughs) I heard this. There's really enough crazy people to keep you in business. And my honest response was similar to what I just shared. These are people who have acknowledged that something needs to happen and they don't yet have the skill set to do it on their own. So again, the reaching out for help is a position of strength. I would have handed him my business card and said, here, actually, yeah, I, I do help crazy people. Here's my business. Here's my business card. We could talk. <laughs> I went, I went a little bit more covert on this one <laughs> to go. I'm just curious. I wonder what kind of things in your life would shift if instead there were things that you reached out and got some help on just out of curiosity and just kind of moved on and you can help those who are actually reaching out for it. I mean, I I can think back to, this was a conversation I had with someone back in January that 2021 was a phenomenal business year and the year started to 2022, a little too quiet and the beginning of the conversation, and I I didn't take any of this personally, it's that it's not that people lie to you, it's that sometimes they've lied to themselves a little too much that it feels true when they repeat it to others. And it was the, yeah, but business is going great. I probably don't need anything like what you do. I'm like, yeah, you mentioned January and February have been, as you said, painfully quiet. What's, What's different? And there was this front that was there at the beginning of it. And, and my world of influence for free, for premium sales is not one of the objection crusher or the hard close. What's going to happen if you don't do anything about this? Because I hate those people do. And uh, so do you. Uh, it's instead letting him from the appropriate coaching mindset, guiding through a process where he can make the discovery for himself. Because it's where someone else in a sales relationship would have you've heard these phrases, twisted the knife, made it more painful, presented the thing and created that fear divide when instead to let this guy kind of go off on his own and take that honest look at where he was. And it kind of goes back, Mike, to what you said that he was not yet taking, he was taking ownership of the success, which was a year ago. He wasn't yet taking ownership of why the things were not yet performing the same way in this current year. And I would say this comfortably, that yes, as he joined us, yes, as he had a stellar month moving forward, utilizing what we shared with him, I've got to say it, unless he had that moment to then go off and really think about it on his own, and it really, as you said, became something that he took ownership of, probably would have implemented, not implemented the knowledge the same way. And this is what so many business owners fail to realize, that part one of this is that not everybody is looking at your website, listening to your podcast, or looking at your social media stuff when they're in a position to make a buying decision, which most often means in a respectful way, they're sitting on the toilet looking at their phone. 
and it's more the ongoing communication of it is where you've kind of planted the seed that begins to grow. And this is why the second phase of everything I do comes around to magnetic connection, which is how do we now create that bond with the people that the messaging does align with? We yeah, have bring shifted them back, internal. Right? St- yeah, we've shifted the story in their mind. And I'd rather have them sign on to something when they absolutely see the fit and see how they're going to put it to use rather than because we're running a promo this week. Trying to force it, it's a it different or, way of looking. Yeah, it's a different way of yeah. looking at it. Yet it comes back to really taking ownership of that and really mm-hmm. shifting that language, not just with others, but also how we how we talk to ourselves. Yeah, I want to say, Jason, I know you you have your own podcast as well, and and this isn't your first rodeo. I'm really enjoying this conversation. We had over 130 plus guests on the show now in the last couple of years. Never had a conversation like this. We've never really covered hypnosis. So this is something I'm really interested in. We're going to take a quick two minute time out to give some love to our sponsors and we're going to come right back and I want to uh, learn a little bit more about you. So we're going to do that in two quick minutes. We'll be right back with Jason. Hey guys, it's Mike. I'd like to give a proper shout out to Navigator Bookkeeping. Look, for a long time, I ran my business without really understanding the full financial picture. I used my gut and my bank account balance to make decisions, which led to some poor choices and constant stress over my business's finances. I knew something needed to change. At the beginning of 2021, I made a decision that helped pave a more clear path for my business. I started working with Navigator Bookkeeping. Since then, my bookkeeping has been handled for me. I now understand the full financial story of my business, making important financial decisions much easier now, and it helps me plan for where my business is going. I highly recommend giving Navigator Bookkeeping an opportunity to help your business. Check them out at navigatingyourbooks.com. Again, that's navigatingyourbooks.com. It's time to know the full financial story of your business. Podcasting is a great way to engage with your audience and stay consistently relevant. The only problem is you don't have the time or desire to produce your own show. You simply want it done for you. And that's where Social Chameleon comes in. All you need to do is press record and upload the files. We'll handle the rest. From planning, production, post-production, distribution, and digital marketing, we have you covered. We realize that times are tough and funds are tight. And Social Chameleon believes in building supportive business relationships. By clicking on the link in this promo, we'll provide you seven free podcasting tips to get started, as well as a free 30-minute online consultation. This is the perfect opportunity for entrepreneurs, keynote speakers, industry experts, influencers, and anybody who has a personal brand. With Social Chameleon, we help you build a brand that is out of this world. We're ready and waiting. So what are you waiting for? Click on the link to get started today. Hey guys, we're back in action with Jason Lynette. And remember, you guys can connect with him on social media. All those links are clickable in the show notes, his website as well. As I teased right before the break, we talked about diving into a little bit more of Jason's story. So we want to get back to the early days. If you can share a little bit, like over two decades ago, right? You've been doing this a long time. Before you're getting into hypnosis, can you talk about some of the greatest influences that you've had in your life that kind of led you to getting into this space and turning it into a business? Absolutely. And clearly, I don't think there's many people who grow up as little kids going, I want to do hypnosis when I get big, that it was a bit of a chance encounter. And like my backstory of a career that I eventually burned out beautifully from was in management of nonprofit arts organizations, which most of that time was actually spent backstage or in the booth calling cues for professional theater. So I wasn't the actor, the director, or the designer. I was the technician wearing all black and a headset, making all the creative people get along, which if that's not psychological training, I don't know what is. Yeah, yeah. And it's... <laughs> I've been a part of those environments before, yeah. Yeah, and it's the part that I would say lovingly sucks the art out of the art, that here would be a beautiful moment on stage with lighting and scenery shifting and music, and yet that was six scrolls of a Microsoft Excel document for me. So helps to explain kind of where I was kind of on my way out of that as soon as I got into it. But of all things, someone came to my college and did 
a comedy stage hypnosis show where they bring up volunteers and get them to do funny things. And by a weird sort of scenario, it was most of my friends that were up there. So this created an odd dynamic as a quick anecdote from the theater background. A lot of my friends were actors, which turned into an offbeat program for this guy doing the show who I've since become a friend with, and he loves the story. You'll see why my friends hate the story, though, which was that the audience wasn't into it because they were going, oh, those are all the acting majors. This is fake. And I'm watching it going, those are my friends, and they're usually not this good of a performer on stage. <laughs> <laughs> this is real. I've got to learn this. And to my credit, none of the people who I'm speaking of are still in the acting career. So um, got that one. So it was where hypnosis was a bit of a hobby for most of that time. And eventually it was the, okay, I started to do sort of a motivational assembly program for schools, which then became a team building workshop for corporate groups, which fun fact was the same program as the school one. We just had different music underneath it. Same program, same message. And it was where the desire to figure out more of what my real passion is these days, the language of it, the communication of it. Of all people, Mr. $100 Bill, Benjamin Franklin, was on the committee reviewing the work of Franz Anton Mesmer, someone being mesmerized or mesmerism, who we could have said that Mesmer was doing hypnosis, but Mesmer was a medical doctor at a time about 30 or 40 years prior to the word hypnosis being attached to the process. And it was Benjamin Franklin who was the one going it's the way his words are shifting their imagination. It's the way that the language patterns are changing these people's stories. That's why this is so effective. And it was the research around that where, honestly, originally the intention was, let me get better at my program that I was doing for these corporate groups or even these schools, where I kind of fell into more of the hypnotherapy training and then launched used to be in Virginia, launched Virginia Hypnosis, which ran for about 13, 14 years prior to moving down here to Florida, seeing all sorts of clients. The bigger sort of influence of all of this, though, to use the word you shared as well as the word that I put on everything, though, would be that when working with a client, there would be this shift where she'd be in front of me. She's a medical doctor, and she's looking to break away from the insurance model and she has a very specific specialty where people are willing to pay out of pocket for it. Yet, even with all of her expertise and all of her case studies, there's the fear of public speaking. And almost as an aside, she sent me her presentation. And as soon as I watched it, it was the, oh, we need to shift this sequence of this. Change the way you're telling the story. Here's the language pattern to make the transition from the story and the invitation that you give them. And as much as the emotional change work shifted the fear structure, the confidence just exploded when she knew the how and the why and the what of what her communication was doing. So I kind of give that sort of Cliff's Notes version of everything because I'm sure for a lot of your audience, just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to do it the rest of your life. So like wow. these days, I don't do the programs for the schools anymore. I've massively diminished the hours I used to spend working with clients one-to-one. -one. And instead, from the vaudeville world, there was an old line of the amateur changes their act, the professional changes their audience. And it comes around to asking who can make use of this even faster. So where in one side of what I do, I run training programs, certification programs for the hypnotic profession. And let's empower more of those people to be the ones that folks work with for the, for the personal change. I see a greater win-win relationships in people's worlds now where not only are they succeeding in their business, but it's the phrase that, Mike, honestly, one time I was on a platform speaking to like 3,000 business owners and I slipped and I said the wrong words and out of my mouth came, it's like that moment where you know your business can change people's lives, but you don't yet have the right words to inspire them to take action with you. And the room leaned in. And that was a different presentation that I was mostly doing there, but I kind of riffed on that to make a transition and get back on track. I forgot my words. And a friend was in the audience and he goes, that felt like an earthquake. The whole room leaned in. And honestly, I went, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, <laughs> so... 
I, I wanted to kind of highlight more of those takeaways because as much as we can hear someone else's story and say, good for you, I'm glad you're doing what you love. It's instead, what can you do with it? And how sometimes it's just that little bit of a shift of the language that creates that massive impact to move forward. Well, I've interviewed so many different people in different professions from, you know, people in entertainment to athletes and Olympians and business entrepreneurs and top 40 entrepreneurs in the world. And, you know, people that have significant social media audiences, if, if there's, you know, more than just a vanity metric behind that, but someone who has like a really core influence in the world. And I mean that in a positive way, some incredible people. But what gets me amped up when I do this show and excited is when I see someone truly in their calling and articulate it the way you did, you speak about it with this purpose behind it. And I know you're doing what you were put on this planet to do. And that gets me super excited. And that's why I wanted to have you be here. We do it at such a high level, but you're willing to take your time to be with us because we can simplify and kind of really make it easy to understand. Let's be real. That's for me. That's for me, guys. I need it to be explained at like a third grade level. <laughs> podcast host to podcast host. We do this for ourselves and just happen to let, you know, many, many thousands of people around the world listen along as well. <laughs> it's very, it's very true. I always do look at it like I'm the first audience member. And the reason I bring the questions up and kind of navigate the conversation as I do is, is really thinking about the audience, what we can learn from this. So yeah, hypnosis is something I'm super you know familiar with or easy to talk about up front. But now you can see after half hour talking to each other here, we've learned so many different ways we can apply it to ourselves. And not everybody listening is an entrepreneur or business person, but we can think about and reflect on different things that maybe we weren't unlocking before because we weren't thinking about it the right way. We, we may be a, a different version of that person at the Thanksgiving table that was kind of ignorant to what you're actually doing. So it's a much nicer it, word that I used. <laughs> if, that, if that's the only thing someone walks away with is... Maybe don't be ignorant to something I'm not familiar with. Why? Like if someone says something and I don't get it, don't mock it. Just say, hey, I don't understand that fully. Can you give me, can you well, explain Let me, let me even it? throw in one little shift here and I'll give a few examples of this, which this is not all I do, but it's an important component of it, that we've used the word hypnosis several times in this conversation. It's where I could really nerd out if you give me a bunch of hours to talk about the whole history of you know, these are not things that were invented. These were discovered by tracking people who were already effective at what they did and asking the question of how do we emulate that? How do we model that? As well as, you know, as business owners or even just as people, even if it's something as simple as how we put away the groceries or how we figure out a specific thing or communicate to our kids, everything comes around to communication and how we then simply put the right words in the right order. And sometimes just that little bit of a shift of the language changes everything where it's like, you know, not to just give the direct plug, but the program I do is called hypnotic influence for premium sales. And notice that it's hypnotic as opposed to hypnosis, because no, here's our financial advisor who doesn't need to say to his uh, clients, look into my eyes, you're getting sleepy. Cause that'd be weird. And even we don't say that mess. Uh, it's instead, it's a brand of influence. It's hypnotic influence. The other little, to call out the term, reframe of this would be that I don't say high ticket. And it's not for the sake of going, oh, it's because everyone else is overusing that and that doesn't work anymore. Oh, no, it does. But it's that everything is relative. And if someone, you did a good amount of research to prep for today. And if someone looks on the web and they see, high ticket, they may see, oh, that's between 3,000 and 10,000. However, I flash to someone in my community that she runs a program teaching people how to make art out of things around the house. She says it herself, basically garbage, and then sell it on Etsy. And that is not a sophisticated audience, not to put down their education or anything. That's not a business savvy audience. So the fact that her digital program is like, what is it now? I think around 300 or $400 to that audience, they would feel that's high ticket. High ticket. Sure. Meanwhile, it's where this little adjustment of premium sales, anyone who's in a service industry, get rid of your cancellation fee. And that may surprise some of you. It's instead a rescheduling policy. Yes, it's the same thing, but as they're paying it, they're smiling and apologizing and thanking you for being courteous. Yeah. Words do matter. 
words matter and how you make someone feel matters even more. And I feel like you're kind of connecting those dots, right? So if you hear someone, whether it's a financial advisor or a high ticket salesperson, they're saying, hey, uh, you know, I'm in high ticket sales or whatever. And right away we're thinking, okay, expensive. But so why do we need to know that you, what you sell is expensive? Is that really what you, would someone come out and be like, I'm selling uh, Maseratis. These are cars are way overpriced. Like that's not what the sales guy is going <laughs> to say. I sold sleep number beds, you know, and I did really well for a long time. And I, those are fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, I still sleep on one. I love it. Uh, great company. And, you know, our price range went from, you know, like a thousand dollar queen size mattress up to 10 grand. And when people would come and be like, what's the best one? I was like, yeah, I don't know you enough yet to, to answer that because it's not just the $10,000 one that's the best one for everybody or the $1,000 one. I could say I'm a high ticket salesperson, but it was the language that I used in a way that would make someone feel where I needed to really learn about them first so I can put them into the one that really made the most sense for them. And I think that's what you're doing for someone is, and tell me if I'm wrong, but you're analyzing how, what they're doing in their, in their processes and you're helping them maybe use different words or body language and a combination of the two to better help whoever they're helping. So you would have looked at me and been like, why do you just take everyone to that, the most expensive bed and say that? Like you're kind of a, a cutting down like 90% of your audience by bringing them over there first. Why don't you get to know them first and then do this, which we actually did have a sales process to follow and it worked really well match up to what they need and what they yeah. want. And I will riff off of that example here just for a quick moment for two reasons. Yes, there is an audience that's out there that wants the more premium option. And that is not everybody, but that is a segment that is there. Let's focus our attention instead on there are people at the end of the day, all of our products, all of our services may be offering the same thing faster and easier. You could fall asleep more easily with that bed that's now made specifically to adjust to what you want it to be. And there's conventional sales, which is either add value, we're going to throw in these pillows with your bed, or there's discount. Hey, it was just Memorial Day and this, this price until that date. In my world of ethical influence, hypnotic influence, it's instead, we change the story. And it's this sort of triangle intersection of where your story, their story, and how your offer fits into the world, where that all aligns is where that back to before that buyer's pocket relationship occurs. And if there's one little change that anyone who has, let's say, easy example would be a digital program could make, assuming this is also part of their goals. I, I mentioned that I took down a lot of my one-to-one, -one, you know, private personal change business many years ago to shift more of my attention to quite honestly doing the same work just in a different sequence, it turns out. I'll add to that. Doing the same work, but making a bigger impact because now your audiences could be larger instead of only one-to-one, -one, you get more group influence and you get people you're training that are now helping, you know, hundreds, thousands, if not more patients over year over the years. So now- yeah. If you look at the, the Jason Lynette thumbprint over time, it's, it's much larger. I'm not sure you articulated it in your head that way. Like, oh, I, this is my game plan. But it makes sense that you, like you it's talked about. focusing on that impact, yeah. Yeah, the vaudeville thing is like, you know, what was it? The amateur focuses on changing their amateur act. Amateur changes the their act, professional changes their audience. Changes the audience, yeah. Let me wrap up this example, if you don't mind, though, which would be that yeah, if you home. have a digital program or some sort of self-guided product, the psychology of this, let me now teach web design for those of you listening to the audio only version of this one, which is going to be fantastic. Basically from left to right, show the lower priced option on the left and the higher priced option on the right. And I can't tell you how many people I've shared this with. It's inside of what I teach people and it's not a fit for everybody. Yet here's someone that his program was 2000 and it was a steal for what he delivered at 2000. And the button on the left was get the program. Okay, it was actually 1997, but we'll call it 2000 for the sake of this because it's easier. And the option on the right, though, said need more help. Click here to get the program plus three private meetings. And that one was off to the side. And I forget if it was either 3000 or 3500. And his sales skyrocketed as a result of this. And in two different ways, by the way, one was that there was an audience of people who weren't previously 
joining his program because they're going, yeah, but I've got so many things I've purchased that I've never actually opened up and used. I'm going to keep looking around. But then because they looked to the right and they saw the, let me hold your hand and give you some assistance while you go through it, rather than exit, they chose the premium option. And there's other people who you can never mind read exactly one of many different scenarios, but there's some might have been the scenario of going, oh, this is fantastic. Oh, wait, there's 3,500? Oh, that's if I want to work with him one-to-one. Oh, yeah, there's a community attached to this. I can do it on my own. And what happened was we took it out of the binary, the light switch, the either on or off. And now, again, conventional sales discount the price or add more value. With influence, we change the story. And the story now was, which one do I choose? Which one's the right fit for me? His percentage of sales went up and he then had to make a few adjustments because more people were choosing the one-to-one option and time became a bottleneck, which in retrospect, his sales were up. And then again, I live by the reality that sometimes in life, the best problems we create are the ones we create ourselves. (laughs) I mean, you've told a couple now stories about helping individuals shift a little bit. There's a little bit of a shift. Sometimes it's just taking whatever it is and just turning it a little bit, right? Just a little bit change. It's like in golf, you know, Tony Robbins has this moment he talks about. I've heard actually people tell this story. I haven't heard him tell it yet, but his coach is laughing at him when he's putting on the green and he's just laughing and laughing. And Tony's like, what the hell are you laughing at, dude? Like, it's kind of like obnoxious, you know? And he's like, just take your left foot and go like that. Just, he moves it like that much and his putt literally like the next putt is perfect. And he's like, that's, he's laughing at you because the course correction is minimal. But here in your head, you're like, I can't do it. I'm way off. It's not going right. And your course correct is so small. Having a a pro like yourself work with somebody, the mental side of it, the verbal side of it is so important. And you've unlocked this for so many people. I've used that word like 10 times already. And I think that's to me, that makes a lot of sense. So I want to talk about some of your case studies. I know there's three simple and definitive parts to what you do. There's the problem, the strategy, and the solution, right? Can you share a few, maybe the the one that pops in your head right now? There's got to be someone you worked with where it's the problem, the strategy, and the solution that really jumps out at you. Yeah, I would go, and I'll make this general for obvious reasons as it's someone's very private story, but it comes around to how the offer was presented. And I'll give the takeaway from this first, which will set the stage for it better, that the things that we get excited about as the business owner are the things that not necessarily are what people are looking for. And this is where so often folks would make the mistake of external blame of, oh, they don't believe in what I do. They don't want this. Oh, people here don't believe in that. Or people here don't want this. And it was someone that she did a service specifically for schools. It was a assembly program that then would bring people into a private program. And it was all very transparent. So it wasn't her using the assembly to then pitch her info products. (laughs) She had a very nice way of kind of making that transition for people. Yet it came around to expert speak, expert speak, expert speak. Those of you in the coaching world, yes, all of your clients have limiting beliefs none of them are going, man, I got to get rid of these limiting beliefs. So the biggest thing was as much as, you know, we've highlighted language, part of this really comes around to asking the right questions at the right time. She started with the right audience. She reached out to her previous clients who were the raving fans who'd have her come back to the school year after year. And we kind of crafted a bit of a survey to figure out more of what was going on. And it was one of these scenarios, and I'll simplify it for time here. She thought her deliverable was this. Instead, the thing she was really providing was something entirely different. And to find out that that's what the schools were dealing with the most. That was the biggest pain point. And we kind of riffed a little while ago on, you know, high ticket versus premium and just the different sets of words. And that's that's expert speak. You know, I don't think anyone's out there going, join my high ticket program. Otherwise, that's like, just put the t-shirt on that just says arrogant and expensive. (laughs) No, it was that instead getting the language to align with what they were looking for. And what was amazing about this was that suddenly crafting the right content to speak to that, 
showcasing the right case studies of her schools that spoke to that. The bookings increased. The rate she was commanding naturally increased, where the real takeaway is it doesn't matter how clever you might think you are or how clever you might even think I am. The brilliance that can be unpacked by the simple metaphor that we have one mouth and two ears, and oftentimes our communication needs to become you know, correlated to that. It was by truly listening to her audience and this nice discovery of what she thought she was providing, yes, was a part of it, but that wasn't their pain point. It was instead this one specific need and shifting all of her communication toward that, which was fun because our first interaction was, well, it's such a saturated market. There's so many people who do what I do. And to share the current trending term in the marketing and business world, by focusing on the real need of her audience, she became the unicorn. She was that one in her space and really set the tone for that, really set the stage for that. And I'd say any other example I can share really comes back to the same principle of how it is that we can evoke. This is how, when I say emotional connection, when I say emotional sales, it's not twist the knife, make them cry and sell them off their pain points. It's instead, what are those core motivators that are driving that person? And then speak directly to that while still satisfying the logical and the tactical sides. As she was there with schools, it was still the matter of it's got to be an appropriate program. It still has to be within her one specific county, the approved vendor list and all the bureaucracy that comes working with schools and how to communicate even to the parents at home okay, so here's everything in the news and here's how, yes, we're doing a program on this other thing, but here's how that will apply. So it's that the greatest thing we often need in our world, even let's bring this to a personal health thing, would be that of feedback. When we're in our own little bubble trying to guess, we could be chasing the wrong thing. And instead, by opening up that calibration, really listening to that specific need on the other side, we suddenly realize what needs to occur. And I always go back to that one because it had these correlated effects towards her husband hating his corporate job. They were in the DC area where I used to live as well. And it turning into, he had to then join her to support the business because it was growing so strong. Eventually, like I did, going, hey, this is a lot of travel. and I'm even doing programs online. I can do this anywhere. Let me live somewhere that's a little bit more on vacation rather than Northern Virginia, DC traffic every single day. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's that lifestyle design. Yeah, I want to pause you for a second because you just gave us a lot to think about. And I'm thinking about how we serve our audience right now. And I can reflect on my own story is when I became, when I changed, made the shift from corporate America, you know, salesman to store manager at Sleep Number and then into entrepreneurship, there was a shift that happened there. And I went back personally just to share with you, I don't think you know this about me, is I have a media production background. That's what I was doing. I did that in college. And as a youngster, I had this love for media. And I felt like it was suppressed because I became the salesperson. I was providing for the family. At that time I was married, my daughter was only a couple of years old. So, you know, doing that kind of the American dream, you know, have the family and everything going. My, a lot of my personal stuff was kind of being suppressed. Nobody told me to do it. Nobody put a gun to my head and said, stop doing the, your passions. But what happened is in 2017, when I ended up getting a divorce and I was doing really well in business, I decided now I need to go back. I can reflect on it. Like you just said, reflect. And I made a decision to get into business and do more with media production and the things that I felt were A, my calling and B, the things that I care about and I'm interested in that I can connect the two. So the sales side with the, the media production side. And I made the mistake that what you're talking about this woman was doing where she was offering something she thought everybody needed, but it wasn't what they either wanted or truly needed. And I did that. I made that mistake for a couple of years. I started off, I was doing web design, testimonial videos, all the stuff that I thought people wanted and not what, you know, kind of listening and, and following the industry a little bit in the market. And then I ended up through listening more and I started my podcast back in November of 2019. People started asking me about it. And then we've, shifted and now are solely a podcast production distribution company, Social Chameleon. So I did exactly what you're talking about. So the reason I shared that a little bit more of a longer story there 
is that what you're talking about is real. Like this people get out there and they start offering something that they think the whole world needs. And, and then they, without the reflection, you may be off the mark just a little bit. So this woman, you know what, that golf stance, she changed her stance after working with you. And now she's doing so well that her husband could leave the job he didn't even like. And they're, they're just crushing it now. I think that's an amazing story. And I want a lot of people right now, I want everybody tuning in to think, hey, do I need to maybe change my footing a little bit and what I'm doing? And why do I sell this product or service? Who's it really helping? And is this really my calling or the thing that I want to be leading with, right? Yeah, I, I deeply appreciate you calling out your own moment of, you know, it felt like it was something being suppressed. And... I eventually became okay with this. I talked about my transition. And if I could really <laughs> put this as the chapter header of the next book, how I got fed up telling other people's stories. So instead I could better tell my own to better empower others to tell their own stories. You know, it was yeah. <laughs> a it's few like too a many three, times. It's a, yeah, it's a, a few too many layer. times sitting in the rehearsal hall of <laughs> two sides of this P productions, which were the ones that going, this is a very important play, but no one wants to watch this uh, mm. <laughs> or respectfully, you know, the musical Greece is just meant to be silly fun. But when the actors are treating it like they're doing Hamlet, you have a hard time keeping a straight face. Right. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's doing, it's, it's kind of, if I understand what you're saying, it's like the right time and place for something like, Three Stooges comedy is hilarious in that when you're watching it together with those guys. But if you put that into like Seinfeld, it's like that's not the right show for that at behavior. And it doesn't make sense. It's like the wrong, wrong time and place for. This could be the next three hours if we let it go. But it's the fascination around storytelling, the fascination around I've never done it, but comedy writing and where different things came from. I think I've just watched the new George Carlin documentary twice already. Because the specificity of language and the pauses, the tonality, and it's just stuck in my head as classic. But when you think about it, like, and just this little transition to watch and go back to even how Steve Jobs would do that entire Apple keynote himself. Now they've had to replace him with like eight people. But it was like you were in the garage watching this man nerd out on something he was excited to share with you. And just that little transition of his of, but one more thing was just this, like the magician revealing the aha moment and how by, again, shifting the communication, there's too many people that are the best kept secret in their industry. Let's help them to break out. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Talking about Steve Jobs, I don't think enough people realize how great of a storyteller he was in a genuine way. And I remember, I forget exactly who he was presenting to, but it was when they were doing like the new Apple headquarters. There's this video I watch that really breaks down his presentation and buy and he has to get from like this, this board of directors and might even been Congress, whatever it was, because he had to build on land that he didn't, he had to get approval on. So this is a different, th this is a different sales process. It's not like, Hey, I'm selling the new widget, the new iPhone, the new gadget. It's I'm, I, I got to sell Apple now to a group of people who don't really care about us because they're in like law and, and legislation, like making sure they're doing the right thing for the community. They don't care about Apple coming in necessarily, but he, he went all the way back to like him making the phone call to Hewlett Packard and them giving him like a summer internship and how he fell in love with making a difference in the technology side and how it, he like, it, it, you know, but it made sense. It's not like he was boring them with this long story. And by the end of it, they all were like high five and like, yeah, we're going to get, let's get him in here. This is what we need, you know, like, so just a really good storyteller to help people understand, get him on the same level with his passion for the project. And that's a really, really great leader and someone who can get a lot of people behind him. So yeah, definitely really, really cool to, to connect the dots on that. Do you mind if I share a quick resource? Just because something you just said, there's a free training I've put together that kind of walks through a formula of how to do exactly what you just talked about. Yeah, let's do it, man. People misspell my last name all the time. They add all sorts of extra letters, so let's make it easy to go to jasoninfluence.com. And that gives you access to something called the Video Influence System, which is basically a seven-step story structure so that one, people actually 
watch past the first couple of seconds of your video. And Mike, even though I call it video influence, it'll work for blog writing, it'll work for social media, it works across different platforms. Yet it's a way of winning the attention in the first couple of moments, shifting the internal dialogue of the audience member, the person watching your content or reading your content. So it's no longer the, this is just another person selling something, but like the Steve Jobs story, this is what reminded me of it. It was bringing people into something, bringing people to become a part of something. And that's where the criteria begins to change. A sequence then of how we start to foreshadow the value in a non-salesy way. And notice that I've yet to say this is finally where you introduce yourself. So not to go, hey, I'm Jason, I teach this, and I'm Barbara, I'm an accountant. Instead, the formula really becomes, as is modeled in that story you just shared, how do we invite our audience to care before we ever ask them to listen and definitely before we ever ask them to buy? And so Jason Influence, that's where that free training is. It's a seven-step process. It works across platform. Video is the easiest one to teach it from. Yet what's great about it and really helpful is how do we grab that attention, but also use it as a mechanism to invite people to then take the next step. Yeah, so good. Jason Influence stack out. That one people can spell, so we point to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so good. It's like it's like a song, like you know, doing things in the right order that just melodically makes it work. And if you kind of put it in the wrong position, or a movie, right? If you have scenes and you put them out of order, it doesn't work. Like if you give some, sometimes it might be cool to give someone the ending and then you backtrack through the story. But like in sales, typically or or relationship, you don't you know, on the honeymoon before they even know how to spell your last name, right? Like, it's just weird to, to, to do that. You, people don't act that way. But sometimes in sales, people start spewing and they don't even have any buyer interest or any It's the stereotype on, of most social media of the person yeah. dropping into your messages and trying to sell you cold. LinkedIn message, yeah. It's like, man, if you guys... You said it. Most of these did. people, <laughs> I'm easy to sell to, but they have yeah. zero chance when they just come at me and bam, they're, hit, they're hitting me over the head. It's like, Dude, all you had to do is say, hey, you know, look at my profile and, and identify something that's interesting to you. Ask me if you want to talk more about it. Hop on a 30-minute free discovery call, which is on my website. So you could have booked it, just booked it, and you could have started to tell me about yourself, and I may actually purchase something from you, but that nobody wants to spend that half hour of time. I got one more question for you, and then I'm going to let you run. You ready? Yeah, bring it. I saved the best one for last, and our audience that tunes in on a regular basis, they know this one's coming. They're waiting for you to answer this. So you, you already have a best-selling book out, five stars on Amazon, but we're going to talk about being an author in a little bit of a different light for a second. So you're the author and protagonist in your own life story. You get to write the ending and God willing, you continue to live a long and prosperous life. You're looking back, you're reflecting on it, and you get to define your legacy. What would that be? I go back to... A statement that I almost made to you a little while ago when we were talking about why we do what we do, which is, this is not my phrase, it's popular now in a lot of different communities of the small hinges swing big doors, of we can go towards the big legacy of these are the people who launched their businesses, these are the charitable things that benefited, and we can go to the obvious stuff. It's those oddly specific things that may be just the smallest moment that created this massive domino effect in someone's life. So I would say it would not be any of the obvious answers that I could come up with. It would be stuff that in retrospect, I'd go, really? Something that little? And I go back to a time where someone who eventually became a good friend and a mentor of mine at the Best Western Hotel just scribbled on a note, consider me a resource, signed his name Mike and gave me his phone number. And just knowing that I had someone that I could field the question to, and even so, running the dialogue of, if I call him, he's going to say this, this is what he would likely respond, I'm good, and would you know, bend his ear at the right time. Yet it's those smallest things that, yes, you know, it's easy for anyone in a business, in a sales relationship to go, these are the collected sales over time, these are the figures, this is that, yet it's the person who, because they stepped away from the career they didn't like, now has lifestyle design, now has a sense of financial independence, was able to be there for the event at their kid's school because they weren't working a job that they had to get permission two weeks before to get off. 
but it's those things that we could never measure and likely we would never hear about. That's the stuff that I love, you know, and the sort of playful version of this is I'll leave her name out, but she had listened to the podcast for a bunch of years and she had sent me so many students and talked up what I did and became a big force in my world. And it became this little unhidden delight that I got to at least say to myself, and Brenda's never bought anything. Here's the impact. And she's someone who, yes, we have this program. Yes, I do that consulting. She's never bought any. And then I was running like this online challenge and like $27 and she then bought it for 27. And I, Mike, true story, immediately refunded her and called her up to go, nope, in my head, you're the person who fits into this role. So no, keep your $27. She goes, well, I did want to talk to you about private consulting and go, fine. <laughs> but it's, it's that again, small hinges swing big doors. It's that littlest of a shift that move your foot. You know, it's the weightlifter, put your wrist that angle. It's the stuff that, you know, wouldn't ever hit the big, you know, byline of the book. It would be those smallest of things that I go to the fact that in my world now, I'm riding bikes with my kids to school in the morning and I'm one of the only dads who does that. You know, the stereotype is the ones that's off to work. It's those littlest of things to have that impact in someone else's life. That's why I do this. That's so good, man. Cheers to you and your success, but also the success of being a great dad, great husband, great person for the, you know, your clients, the many one-to-one clients you've had in the past and, and the, the many clients that can learn from you in more of a group setting, larger setting, learn through you from your podcast, for you being a guest on the podcast today, they can learn from you this way. So I just want to say I'm grateful. You know, I always say be kind. The other two things I always say is be great and be grateful, man. And I'm so grateful for you being on the show. And I think that's really well said that instead of only focusing on these big macro goals and these things you want to be known for and the cover of a big magazine or this or that, all those things can and may happen, but it's the little micro things that you care about that's really your legacy built up over time. It's like if you're building something monumental, it's the bricks that actually build it. But if you look at it, oh, this is a beautiful building. Coliseum, right? It's all these bricks. Like it it doesn't get built. Just It's not a one piece unit. You don't just drop a a beautiful monument somewhere. Like it gets built, you know? Look at the, the pyramids. It's literally layers and layers of all these stones built together. So I think that's your legacy is more focused on the micro than the macro. And I've never had anybody explain it that way. That's really, really cool. I think a lot of people right now are reflecting on it going, I thought about that for myself too. Getting my kids to school, being there for their play, those little things, helping someone that may only, you know, unlock something small, but it ends up being something big in the long term. Right? Everybody's trying to chase the dinosaur, hunt the dinosaur, not the rabbit. I'm not a fan of hunting or injuring animals. So <laughs> it's a weird analogy for me to make. But the point is, I was thinking so big, but you can... You can make these little micro things. So really well said. Anything you want to leave our audience with uh, last second before heading out? I love your little tagline there. I'll share mine of change your words, change your business, change your life. Yeah, you're doing that, man. Thank you so much for your time here, Jason. This was this Thank was Thanks well worth the, uh, the three times the charm <laughs> to get you <laughs> on the show. Have a great one, brother. I'd like to give a huge shout out to everyone for tuning in, especially those who listen all the way to the end to hear this message. Seriously, I appreciate you and my guests do as well. Giving a quick reminder to subscribe to this show, it's completely free and will allow you to receive notifications when new episodes are released. If you'd like to provide a tip as a gift, you can do so via patreon.com backslash miked up. It's spelled M-I-K-E-D up, patreon.com backslash miked up. You can give as little as $1 per month or as much as you'd like. Every dollar is greatly appreciated and completely unexpected. Appreciate your reviews and your messages coming in on social as well. Keep them coming. Your feedback is valuable and absolutely means the world to me. You can check out more episodes and content at mikeduppodcast.com. We're powered by Social Chameleon. You can also follow me on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active, and it's at Mike DiCiocco, M-I-K-E-D-I-C-I-O-C-C-I-O. Thank you so much for your continued support. You guys know what to do. Be great and be grateful.